Good morning, everyone. We're just giving it one more second so that people can join in and then we'll start the webinar. If you're just joining, the slide handout will be in the webinar chat. I will drop it in there a couple of times during the presentation so you have time to download it. I think we can get started. Good morning. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar titled Demystifying Leaves of Absence, Expert Guidance for California Businesses. This is part one of a part of a two-part uh, series on leave of absence presented by Ethos Human Capital Solutions and Murhab Robinson and Clarkson Law Corporation. My name is Denise Ketty and I am your moderator for this session and I want to go over a couple of quick housekeeping notes. Before I introduce today's uh, expert panel, the webinar will run approximately 60 minutes. We will leave some time to answer some of your questions at the end of the webinar. If you need to leave the webinar before the conclusion, the link to the webinar will be sent out afterwards. And also it does get posted on the Ethos YouTube channel and on the Merhab Robinson YouTube channel. So they'll both be posted later on. I keep adding the link to the slides. I'll do that again when we're done so that you can get your slides. Uh, if you have questions that you'd like to ask during um, the presentation, we will do those at the end, but you can post them in the Q&A area anytime during the presentation. If you'd like your question directed to a specific person, please make sure that you list that in the question. If you have issues during the, during the presentation, you can email me directly at denisemketty at gmail.com. Quick reminder that today's webinar is being recorded and all accompanying materials are protected by copyright. Our presentation today is intended for informational purposes only and should not be relied on in reaching conclusion in any area of law. The information offered during the webinar is as of today, April 4th, 2024. As always, we recommend that you consult with your own legal counsel to address your specific situation and to ensure that you have the most current information on all the legal matters. Our webinar today has been approved for HRCI credit. There we go. If you want credit for your attendance, please complete the follow-up survey when you receive the link. Upon completion of the survey, you will receive your certificate. So let's get started today and I'll introduce you. Oh, there's the little link. Yeah, I put this in, Denise, because everybody always says there was no link at the end. This is the slide when after you complete your information and you take the survey, you'll see a thank you. And then you'll see the link right there where you can go download your certificate. OK, perfect. Thanks. So today, our legal expert is Curtis Uryan. Curtis is an associate at the law firm Merhab Robinson and Clarkson in the firm's transactional department, where he advises clients on real estate, finance, business succession planning. Curtis also contributes to articles and law journals, is a part-time lecturer, teaches classes, has been named a rising star in Southern California law by super lawyers from 2017 to 2023. He is also a foodie and a dog lover, so that's why we all love Curtis. Our next presenter is Linda Duffy. Linda is the president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Her team is known for the building of the magic of human connection with their consulting programs in recruiting, training, and also payroll support. Uh, the Ethos team works with your company by developing strategies for businesses, leaders, to get the right systems, people, and culture in place within your organization so that you as a business owner or an HR executive can focus on running your business and achieving the goals. Linda's clients range from high-tech businesses to manufacturing firms to nonprofits, and she's versed in founder-CEO-led businesses. Linda is also looking forward to baseball season, and tomorrow's going to be her happiest day of the year, she just informed us, because the Angels home opener. So Linda, exactly. now that's a great move talking about the angels <laughs> started on leave of absence. 
It is true. We go from my favorite day of the year to my least favorite topic, but <laughs> we, we will we will get through this today. So hi, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. This is our agenda for today. So part one of leaves of absence is all about individual medical conditions. So when your employee you know, gets injured or is sick or whatever the case is. And then next month when we come back, we'll talk about the other, you know, million different leaves of absence that California requires you to provide. Um, we know the common questions that we get from clients all the time. So we will address those common questions. We have some scenarios built in, but we will always save time at the end of our hour to answer your questions. So just feel free to drop them into the Q&A section and Denise is monitoring those and then she'll be asking them. Um, asking them a month later. So just to get started, just to tell you how we've laid this out, here are the common questions we sort of have to always know when we're talking about leaves of absence, you know, starting with, is the company even required to provide this particular leave? And that's usually tied to headcount. Um, is the employee eligible? There will be service requirements. There'll be qualifying events, right? So we'll take a look at those at all. Talk about how much leave the company is required to provide, whether you need to reinstate the employee, you know, does the employee have to give you notice under what circumstances, can, as an employer, can you require the employee to use their accrued sick and vacation time, and then how does the leave affect employee benefits? So we've laid out each of these leaves that we talked about by answering those questions for you. So hopefully uh, that will give you some guidance next time an employee comes to you with the leave. We've also used a lot of abbreviations, so I just wanted to put this page up to let you know if you see ER, we're talking about employer, EE is employee, and then all of the different leaves that we're going to be talking about, we've used some abbreviations for those as well. And with that, Curtis, let's start talking about FMLA. This is the big leave, right, at a federal level that protects employees when they personally are injured, among other reasons, um, and FMLA is really just applies to companies that have 50 employees in a 75 mile radius. So Curtis, let me start by asking you, if an employer has say 25 employees at their headquarters in Southern California, um, and they have another another 26 employees, right? But they're scattered across the country. Does this law apply to them? So if, this is a good question and it's, it's a little bit strange and it's confusing. So the answer it technically is yes, the employer is a covered employer under FMLA if they have 50 employees across the country. But if the employees are scattered across the country, from a realistic perspective, no employee is going to be eligible for FMLA benefits because employees are only eligible if they work at a facility with 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius. So this gets a little confusing. Employers that are covered by FMLA, but effectively are not going to have any employees that are going to be eligible for FMLA still need to comply with the FMLA requirements. That Basically, when I say that, they still need to comply with the notice requirements. But each time that employer goes to give a notice requirement, that notice is going to say, sorry, employee, you're not eligible because you don't work at a facility with 50 or more employees within a 75 mile radius. But the general rule is yes, an employer is covered by FMLA if the employee has 50 or more employees. There's a handful of rules for how the employer is required to count their employees for compliance with FMLA. We're not gonna get into many of the, the details here in this webinar. Uh, we're really just looking to talk about the the general requirements, but just know that if you have temporary staff and employees, um, if you have employees on a leave of absence, um, if, if you are, um, if you're an owner and you have multiple companies that are related, but you have employees that are employed by those, those different entities, there might be some joint counting rules. So just know that um, when you're counting employees for the, the, the 50, 50 employee threshold, there are some additional rules that you need to consider. You ever have any questions? Call me, call Linda. We could we could work work through those with you. It would be so great, Curtis, if the federal government would just define employee the same way for every single rule we have and make it a lot easier. It would be nice for those county it be, purposes. It would be nice if California would also adopt yeah, right? one one rule for counting for all of their laws, but it's 
Um, unfortunately, the rules for counting are different per statute. Yeah. So if you're you're eligible for this leave, again, if you satisfy the three standards. So one thing is you have to have worked for the company for at least 12 months. So somebody that, that automatically joins, um, you know, isn't, I'm sorry, somebody that joins your company isn't automatically eligible for this right out of the gate, like they are for pregnancy disability leave and other laws. So this one does have a one-year service requirement, and you have to have worked at least 1,250 hours in that 12 months prior to your leave. Um, and then as we talked about, there's a headcount provision. And then there's different qualifying events. Um, so the ones listed here, you know, birth of a child, because again, you'll see in a minute when we talk about pregnancy and CFRA, um, FMLA can run concurrently with the pregnancy disability leave in California and does cover birth of a child where CFRA carved that out in California. Um, if you, you know, adopt a child or have one through foster care, you're covered. If you have a seriously ill family member, your own health condition, which is really what we're focused on today. And then also there's military family leave. Going on to some of the other things, just to know that there is um, there is a document that you are able to use as you go through here for asking the employee to fill it out and get it back to you for a certification. We took a screenshot of this because the federal version of this contains the word diagnosis. And Curtis, you want to tell tell everybody why that's important to note? Yeah. So California law uh, gives and gives employees a little more privacy rights than federal law. So um, under California law, you can't, you can't ask what the employee's diagnosis is. So we, even though the, the federal government, the Department of Labor has uh, created this form, I actually prefer not to use this form in California, even for, for any purpose, just because there's a there's a there's a couple items in the forms that don't quite comply with federal law, and that's mainly because the federal law is asking for the diagnosis, which we can't ask for in California. Yeah, so I will give everybody a, just a little tip. You can actually modify this form and remove that word. <laughs> so yeah. that's what we do sometimes, although California does have uh, similar forms. So it's your decision which forms you want to use. You can use this, but just take out the word diagnosis, um, make it a little bit easier on everybody and be, stay compliant there. So for FMLA, the length of the leave available is 12 weeks in that 12-month period. It can be taken intermittently. It doesn't have to be taken consecutively. It's longer if you're caring for a service member. And what we usually recommend is that you do this on a rolling 12-month period. I don't know, Curtis, if you um, suggest the same thing, because you can use a calendar year. You can use any 12-month fixed period of time, like from their service anniversary, um, things like that. There's different ways to do it. We just feel like if you just do it on a rolling 12-month period, it's probably... Right. Uh, better. You agree, Curtis? Yeah, I agree. Um, it, it also helps prevent employees from taking advantage of FMLA rights because you don't want an employee to, to take 12 weeks at the end of the year and then have a new year start on January 1st and then take another 12 weeks. So exactly. the goal is really to space it out so that employees are not uh, taking advantage of the law. Exactly. And Curtis, one of the questions I know we get a lot is, do I have to hold this job open? Right. It's really hard for especially for small employers. And even if you have 51, you're you know, you don't have duplicates of a lot of different positions. So, you know, under what circumstances do people need to hold the position open? And percent of the time, the employer must. Uh, hold the position open. I mean, we could talk about layoffs and reduction of force. Uh, um, yeah, reduction of force. I don't really want to get into that into this webinar, but for the most part, you have to leave the the position open for the employee or or guarantee reinstatement to the the employee. Um, there are some circumstances where you can refuse to reinstate a key employee, like if you're, I don't know, chief engineer officer who's the only person who does that work needs a leave of absence and you can't afford to to not have somebody do that work, uh, you can replace that that 
key employee and refused to reinstate, reinstate the person that went on a leave of absence. But those are very limited circumstances. And if you ever want to try to, to try to do that, try to rely on this exception, give me a call, give Linda a call, talk, talk through it with us first, because it's, it's very yeah. narrow circumstances. Yeah. I mean, we rarely see that come up. I mean, it's just usually it's any employee and they just don't want to hold a position open. And it's unfortunate for the employer, but it has to be done that way. You have options. I mean, you can, you know, have someone fill in as a temp, you can have other employees split up the duties. There's other things you can do. Totally understand that it's a hardship, um, but that's just not an option. And then the next question is, does the employee, is the employee required to give the employer notice? And yes, if it's foreseeable, then 30 days notice. You won't always have the option of denying um, their leave or postponing is really how I should look at it. Postponing the leave if they don't give you proper notice. Under some circumstances, you can. Uh, just know that there is an affirmative obligation on the employer to basically offer the leave of absence if you have noticed that one is required. And that could be, you know, you see an employee come in, you know, and is clearly really sick, or you find out that an employee has cancer, or you get told something else. The employee does not have to say, I need an FMLA leave. <laughs> so that's not the notice we're talking about. But if you have noticed that, um, if you have any information that the employee would you know, require leave or triggers the eligibility for leave, then you need to provide the information to them about the leave of absence and the rights. So let's talk about the eligibility notice, Curtis, because this is really the first one right. the employer has to provide, right? Yeah, and this is what you were just talking about at the end of that last slide. So as an employer, if an employee comes to you and makes a formal request, I want to take FMLA, FMLA leave, the employer has five business days of the initial request to present the employee with written the written eligibility notice. That eligibility notice, we'll, we've got another slide that talks about the details on, that have to be included in that notice, and there are plenty of like we saw earlier, there are forms that we can use. But the idea, the purpose of this eligibility notice is to say, employee, you've requested FMLA, FMLA leave. Um, these are the requirements. You've either met or not met the requirements. If you've met the requirements, you can take FMLA leave. It's an automatic right. Um, there's, we generally cannot deny it. Or, But if the employee does not meet the requirements of FMLA, the eligibility requirements, then you have to state in that notice, you are not eligible for FMLA, and here's the reason why. Now, yeah. I, I've said that, you know, if an employee comes to you and re specifically requests, I want FMLA, you have to do this. But like Linda said before, even if an employee comes to you and, and gives you any kind of notice that the employee might need to take or might be wanting to take time off for an FMLA-related re reason, Right, we listed them on an earlier slide: birth of a child, own medical condition, immediate family member uh, medical condition. You still have five business days to give an eligibility notice to the employee and let the employee know, hey, you can you can take FMLA if you want, and here's a form for you to fill out if you want to formally request it. Yeah. So it doesn't have mm -hmm. to be the employee walks into your office and says, "Boss." Sir or ma'am, I want to take FMLA, right? The the employee could could text you and say, Oh, I broke my ankle. I'm gonna be out for two weeks. That's also a trigger. You've got five days to prepare the eligibility notice and, and give it to the employee, even if the employee didn't specifically say, I want to use FMLA. Right. Cause never in the history of the world has that ever happened. So right. <laughs> they might say, I need a leave of absence or I need time off. Or like you said, I broke my ankle. I'm going to be out for two weeks. The other thing on the eligibility notice, it may be saying we don't have enough information to decide whether or not you're eligible for a leave. Right. So it could be that, um, you know, you're, the employee texts you and says that, but my, the first thing you should be doing is saying, hey, you may be eligible for this, but we don't have enough information. Have your doctor, you know, fill this out and get it back to us. So the next form is really a rights and responsibilities notice. And I know this is a little bit of an eye chart, but basically what you want to do is lay out all of those details as Curtis was mentioning and things like, you know, is your job protected? Um, what happens to your insurance? You know, if you're having 
if you're paying a portion of the premium out of payroll deductions, then what are you expecting the employee to do during that time period, right? So is the employee going to write you a check each month? Are they going to double up before they leave and have deductions taken out? Are they going to double up when they return? Like, what is it you want them to do about that, right? So there's different things that you need to include on that rights and responsibilities notice once you've made that determination that they're eligible for a leave of absence. I just want to insert here real quick, yeah. the most common mistake that I see employers make when it comes to FMLA is this eligibility notice, not presenting the eligibility notice and filling it out with all the information that was, was on that slide. Because oftentimes, a lot of times I get calls from employers that will say, this person's been on a leave of absence for three months. What do we do? And I ask, well, have they exhausted their FMLA? Have you done this? What, what, you know, what are their circumstances? And so many times the response is, I don't know. And yeah. I, I, I don't mean to dis disparage or be negative about any of those clients, but so many of these problems could just easily be solved by issuing a proper eligibility notice and designating the leave as FMLA and then counting the, the FMLA weeks as the, the person's on a leave of absence. Yeah, we say it all the time too, Curtis. I mean, a lot of our clients are smaller. They don't have, you know, an internal HR person. Um, they have somebody that drew the short straw, as I said, and got stuck with doing it, but they don't know about the requirements in terms of notification. And so this employee has been out for weeks. They want to know, can I let the employee go? You know, like I had that situation recently where somebody – was out on a leave of absence since last November to care for a sick wife, right? That's one of the times where you can limit their time off to 12 weeks. They were gone for that period of time and then the employer wanted to fill the position. So I said, great, you know, did you designate the leave when they went out and did you give them the rights and responsibilities notice and they hadn't done anything in writing. So I had yeah. to tell him, you know, you can't count that time. You can't go back retroactively to November and start counting that time. So it's really, it is an important, you know, issue to make sure that you document the leave properly in writing, that you give them the first notice within five days, then you turn around, you give them the second notice as soon as you've determined that they do qualify for a leave. Another question that we get asked a lot is, can, can the employer require the use of sick or vacation? And this is sort of generally how I think about it, Curtis. You tell me this is a good way of thinking about it. But if the, <clears throat> excuse me, if the leave of absence is for the employee's own medical condition, pregnancy, cancer, broken leg, whatever it is, then you, re you can require the use of sick. If it's for taking care of somebody else, you cannot. So if it's related to their own medical condition, you can require sick, but not vacation. If it's related to something else, you can require vacation, but not sick. Is that, is that good, Curtis? Yeah, that's my understanding. I'm sorry? That's, that's, that's my understanding. I'm needed. Yes. And yeah, then, so FMLA is unpaid unless the employee has accrued benefits that are available. And um, like Linda said, you can you can force the uses of paid benefits in, in some circumstances and in some circumstances you can't. Yeah, and I would sort of tie this into the next thing on the slide, which is the effect on be benefits, right? So under FMLA, you're required to keep group health benefits in place as though the employee was still working. Right. So that going back to what I said before, they can you can still require them to pay their portion. Well, how do they do that when maybe they're collecting disability, which is a portion of their pay? Right. They're out on a leave. They don't have the ability to earn more income. And now you're telling them, hey, write me a check for what normally would come out of your paycheck. Well, one option yeah. for them might be, hey, if you let me sort of, you know, take sick or vacation time, we could deduct it out of that. It helps the employer because now, you know, when they come back, they're not going to say, now I'd like to take two weeks of vacation, right? So it's sort of a win-win. It helps the employee cover those costs without dipping into the disability when they're already receiving less pay than they normally would be. Yeah, it's a great point. Anything else on FMLA before we move on, Curtis? Just that. So the two things that I want to emphasize is that FMLA is a, is a strict benefit. If the employee is eligible for it, the employee gets it. As opposed it's to what? just how it is. <laughs> well, so as opposed to, um, it's, it's not really a question of granting it 
or discussing discussing whether it's an undue hardship or whether the the company can uh, afford or be able to let someone take FMLA leave. If someone's right. eligible for FMLA, they get it. Yep. You, you can't really have a conversation about whether they're they can get it or not. And exactly. two, just like we said before, give the eligibility notice in writing, designate the leave in writing. Definitely. All right, let's move on to California Family Rights Act. It's sort of the sister law to FMLA. However, it's different from FMLA, and it's changed a couple times over the years. So initially, it was pretty similar, except that it carved out pregnancy, because California already had a separate pregnancy disability leave law. A few years ago, it also changed the requirements. So it used to be like FMLA in that you had to have 50 or more employees in a 75 mile radius. Now that's no longer a requirement. California says employees are covered if they satisfy the two standards of working 1250 hours, right? And having been with the company for a year, but now it's every employer is covered if you have five or more employees. There's no radius. There's no, you know, anything yeah. else. If you have five employees, you're a covered employer under CFRA. Yeah. California Family Rights Act, CFRA is modeled after FMLA. So CFRA came into existence after F FMLA, but California wanted to basically expand the leave rights for California employees. So like Linda said, instead of a 50 employee threshold, it's five. Instead of a 75 mile radius, it's if there's five. Yeah. But the the eligibility standards are are similar in that the employee still has to have worked 12 months prior to the leave of absence, worked 1,250 hours within that 12 months uh, prior to the leave of absence. The qualifying events are um, a are expanded somewhat. We've, we've listed the details here. Um, but for the most part, it's a copy and paste of FMLA. So we'll, 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 we'll spend a little bit less time on CFRA just because we've already talked about a lot of the rules already in FMLA. So again, there, there's, there's specific rules for how do we count those five employees and um, there's specific rules for how do we count the 1250 hours but just just know that um, it's it's very similar to FMLA. It's just expanded in California. Yeah, and there are some uh, there are differences in ter terms of coverage. You can see in the bottom box, you know um, how they define family members and things like that. There's also this designated person requirement that showed up last year, the year before, and then with military caregiver leave, a little bit different. Um, and then pregnancy is excluded. But for the most part, they run parallel. And one of the things you need to remember is if you're going to designate under FM FMLA, most likely, unless it's pregnancy, you're going to designate it under CFRA as well. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So the length of leave available is the same, excluding the military caregiver leave, which is not covered under CFRA. It's job protected just like FMLA is. Employees have to give you notice just like FMLA. Anything you want to add on this slide, Curtis? Because this this one's pretty straightforward. Yeah, so we're we're, we're recording the, the the webinar like we do all of our webinars, and we're going to post them on our our, our YouTube pages. Um, if you were if you're working for a smaller employer, employer, let's say you have twenty employees, and you heard us start talking about FMLA at fifty, and you spaced out for the last <laughs> twenty minutes, um, you can go back and rewatch all the all the, everything we said about FMLA because it a lot of it does apply to CFRA. So hopefully um, you paid attention because a lot of it's going to be the same. You're still going to have to pay attention to it under CFRA. Yes. And as I was just not just noting a second ago, if you're designated under FMLA, most likely you're also designated as a CFRA. So you want to make sure that you're checking both of those boxes when you give them the designation notice and you tell them like, here are your rights and responsibilities and yes, you're covered and all of that. So again, you cannot go back and retroactively designate something unless there's again, a, like a little sliver of hope. If you did not know at the time that it was going to be an FMLA covered event, you know, maybe the employee just called out sick, called out sick, called out sick. And then all of a sudden you're like, no, get us a doctor's note. Um, then you might be able to go back, but you want to make sure that you get as much information up front as possible. That you designate it properly and then go on from there. 
All right. So Curtis, same thing about sick and vacation? Yeah, for the most part, there, there's a little bit different rule for um for for pregnancy leave, just because uh pregnancy disability leave, as we'll talk about here in a bit, um, does not run concurrent with CFRA. Uh, but for the for the most part, um the rules for paid for continuing benefits and and using paid time off for um, CFRA leave are going to be a are going to be the same. There are a few um, differences here, again, just because California is a little more expanded. Uh, but for the most part, you can think of it as as generally being the same. Yep, just check that extra box. <laughs> okay, so let's move on to pregnancy disability leave law. This one comes up a lot, obviously, in California. Um, and women in California have a greater uh, benefit than a lot of employees have in other states. We have this happen a lot too, where somebody moves out of state during COVID and all of a sudden found out there's no pregnancy disability law, there's no benefit, there's no leave of absence, no nothing, right? So California does provide that higher benefit to pregnant women. So um, covered employees, this is five or more. Um, there's no length of service requirement for pregnancy disability leave. I mean, I had somebody on my own team start with us last year, and then she'd been here like a month and said, hey, guess what? Good news, I'm pregnant. And then, you know, I gave her a leave of absence because that's what's required, and she was out for several months toward the end of the year. So, again, that's what the employer is is obligated to do. Uh, so this is specific if it's a pregnancy-related disability preventing work. And the reason I highlight that is because I hear a lot of people say, oh, I'm pregnant, I get four months off. And that's not what the law says. <laughs> you want to explain the difference, Curtis? Yeah, you get... Um, I think... You're breaking up a little bit. Sorry, I think this is relating to uh, the, the, the next slides or so, but... Yeah, so a, a disability due to pregnancy has to be, um, so let me take a step back. You can only take time off under PDL if you are disabled due to pregnancy. It's not a blanket, four months off, see you in four months. You have to ha actually be certified by your doctor stating that um, the employee is disabled due to pregnancy and is unable to work, that there may be different reasons before childbirth where an employee is disabled due to pregnancy. There's a lot of medical related medical conditions that, that could cause it. And then of course, childbirth, there's a, a lot going on at childbirth. I've got kids myself. I've, I've seen, I've, I've seen what my wife has gone through. Um, and then recovering from childbirth, uh, that's considered a disability and is eligible to take time off from work under pregnancy disability law. Yeah, it could be morning sickness. It could be, you know, doctor says, hey, you need to have bed rest. It can be a whole bunch of different things, postpartum depression. There's a whole bunch of different things that go into a pregnancy-related disability. Again, we always say, go back to what the doctor says, right? If the doctor says this person can't work for these reasons, then that's what you go by. I'm not suggesting you just take take the woman's word for it, right? Like we wouldn't take any employee's word for it, just like, hey, I need a leave of absence, um, we've seen that happen where an employee will text or email or something and say, hey, I need the next X number of months off. We're not suggesting that, but it is more than, you know, the four weeks before and six weeks after, which is a typical uh, disability period. Um, so the length of leave can be up to four months or 17 and third weeks. It can be taken on an inter intermittent basis. Um, they do have the same right to be put into the original position that they left. So it's similar to FMLA and CFRA. And again, notice should be required. I mean, most people would know uh, if they're pregnant, hopefully. <laughs> hopefully it's not a surprise to anybody there. And then Curtis, you want to talk about, you know, the steps here and what they need to do. Yeah. So if an employee lets you know that the, the employee is expecting then and is we're going to request time off under pregnancy disability leave. Uh, the employer is, is required to respond no later than 10 days after receipt of the request. And when the, time, the employee does take time off for pregnancy disability leave, uh, PDL and FMLA do run concurrently. And again, because FMLA is kicked in, you only have five days, five business days under FMLA to respond. Uh, and once the leave is approved, 
pregnancy disability leave is retroactive to the first uh, date of leave. Where before we said FMLA and CFRA are not, but pregnancy disability can be retroactive to the first day of leave. Yeah, so just keep in mind on this one, CFRA, and we're going to show you a chart in a second, but C CFRA and PDL are mutually exclusive, right? Because California, when they put California Family Rights Act in, as they said, well, we already have pregnancy covered. We don't need to include it in here, so it's carved out. But it is not carved out under FMLA. So if you're an employer over 50, then you want to designate the under PDL and FMLA, right? Because otherwise the FMLA benefits are still there. So you could potentially, you know, extend that leave of absence longer. So you want to make sure you designate it under both of them. Um, can the employer require use of sick and vacation? Yes to sick, no to vacation, no to PTO because it's combined. So you got to play by the higher standard there. You can offer vacation, right? So again, if they need to, looking at the bottom part of the slide, pay for uh, the the amount of money that normally would come out of their paycheck for their benefit contribution, they may want to sort of sell back vacation if that makes sense. You just want to make sure that you're coordinating those those that pay for uh, disability benefit purposes, and you make sure that you report it correctly and things like that. But the effect on benefits, same thing, got to leave them in place. So let's take a look at this slide that I mentioned a minute ago because I hopefully this will make some sense to people. So let's say somebody comes to you, you know, and they say, hey, I need to go out on a pregnancy disability leave. And let's just assume for the sake of argument, they're going to exhaust it. If you look at the middle line from PDL, they're going to be out from, you know, February till sometime in May because they're going to take 17 and a third weeks. You're going to designate FMLA to run concurrently with that. So that's going to get exhausted prior to the PDL. But then once the baby's born, they do have baby bonding rights, which would be covered under CFRA. So this is a pretty typical scenario that we run into all the time where a woman gives birth. She's out for whatever period of time she's disabled under pregnancy disability leave law. And then when she once she has the baby, there'll be a period of time where the doctor says she's disabled as she recovers from childbirth. Once she's released to return to work, she can immediately turn around and say, now I want to take 12 weeks for baby bonding. Curtis, want to run anything on that? So she gets 19, or sorry, 29 and a third weeks off. 29 and a third weeks off, potentially, right? That's over six months. It is, and we've seen it a lot, right? And the other thing is that baby bonding does not have to be taken um you know, immediately after they have one year from the date of birth to be able to take those 12 weeks, it can be taken in different increments. There's different rules around that, which is in the weeds for this webinar. Um, but just know that that's the possibility, right? That this person's out 29 and a third weeks if they're disabled during that full time. All right, Curtis, let's move on to American with Disabilities Act. You want to take that one? Yeah, so American with Disabilities Act, the federal law, this law applies to um, any employer with 15 or more employees. And again, there's a whole set of rules of how we count employees and how we um, determine if it's 15, we hit the 15 employee threshold or not. And it applies to all employees with qualifying disabilities. Why, why does this matter? This will often come up if you have, uh, if an employer does not have 50 employees, right, is not covered by FMLA. If an employee makes a request for a leave of absence and that employer is not covered by FMLA, the employer is still going to want to think about compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act because a leave of absence can be an accommodation for a medical condition. So if you're not subject to FMLA, but you have 15 or more employees, you need to think about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And the, the qualifying events for uh, leave under ADA is a disabled employee requiring time off as a form of a reasonable accommodation. Yeah, and the definition of disability is sort of important in this because when we look at FEHA um, in a minute, the definition of disability is different, right? So the dis the disability here means a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. 
right? It goes on with some more words after that, but it's substantially limits a major life activity. And then you'll see in a minute when we talk about FIHA, it's a, even higher, um, or I should say a lower standard. <laughs> I'll say it that way. It's a yeah. lower standard under FIHA. There's quite a bit of case law too. It's been litigated a lot what the definition of disability is under under ADA. So it, it's, a, it's a fairly well-developed area of law. So on this one, the length of leave available, as Curtis said, it's not that the ADA actually grants the right to a leave of absence, but they say that you must reasonably accommodate this person with this disability. So a reasonable accommodation may be to grant time off. So this is really frustrating to a lot of employers because somebody on a leave of absence may exhaust their FMLA, may exhaust CFRA, or may exhaust their pregnancy disability leave law. And then they're like, okay, I want to fire this person. And we're like, mm, not so fast because you have a right or you have a responsibility to accommodate that person by giving them additional time off. And again, there is in this law, an undue hardship exception. And I'm going to say, Curtis is going to say, but. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah it, like, like Linda mentioned, there is no limit uh, under ADA. Um, the, the question that you have to answer is if the person is requesting an accommodation, a leave of absence as an accommodation, is that leave of absence reasonable? Can you sustain it? Or is it an undue hardship to the company? So if somebody is not eligible for, for FMLA, and we'll pretend that CFRA doesn't exist. If an employee comes to you and says, I need to leave of absence because I broke my ankle, then you need to go through the, the good faith interactive process to determine if that re requested accommodation of a leave of absence is reasonable. You can sustain it. And there's a lot of litigation. There's a lot of case law on what that means. Or is that requested leave of absence an undue hardship? If you're, you are subject to FMLA, you are subject to CFRA, and you've allowed, you've accommodated that person for 12 weeks of leave under FMLA or CFRA, and that those 12 weeks expire, and you want to then claim an undue hardship, you're probably not going to be able to claim an undue hardship if you have accommodated that employee for the previous 12 weeks. Judges typically think that if you have been able to accommodate an employee for 12 weeks, that you can continue to accommodate an employee. If you've been able to sustain that leave of absence for 12 weeks, you're probably going to have to continue that leave of absence. Um, even though the leave of absence was, you were forced to grant the leave of absence under CFRA or FMLA, um, if you've been able to sustain it for 12 weeks, then there's likely no undue hardship. It's likely reasonable that you have to continue to sustain that leave of absence. Yeah. Linda, so what if what if an employee comes to me, comes up to you or comes up to the employer and says, I need an un indefinite leave of absence, indefinite. I don't know when I'm going to come back. Yeah, I would say we need to more know more, right? I would I would actually ask them to go get a doctor's certification, and hopefully the doctor is going to uh, put some limits on that. But as we know, that can get extended over and over and over and over and over again. So yeah, the 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 courts have said there's no obligation to provide an indefinite leave of absence. But like you said, if if somebody has a note that says I'm off for a month, a month goes by. They get another note. I'm off for a month. Month goes by. That practice can continue to happen and happen and happen. So even though there's no obligation to, to provide an indefinite leave of absence, you might end up going that direction because an employee can get a new note every month or every two months or every or every period, every so often. Exactly. So let's move on. I'm, I'm watching the time here. Uh, FIHA. So we said a minute ago, FIHA is really similar to the ADA, except that in this case, it's five or more employees. Uh, the eligibility, the qualifying events, all of that is the same. Now, there is one thing that's different, which is the definition of disability. So I said a second ago that ADA says something that substantially limits a major life activity. In this case, it says limits 
right? It also includes perceived disabilities, which is a little bit different as well. So anytime an employee comes up, they have, again, they have some medical condition that's going to require time off. You need to take a look to make sure, um, you know, which which leave laws may get triggered and which other laws may get triggered in this case. FEHA also is not a leave law per se, um, but a reasonable accommodation may be time off. Uh, so we want to make sure that that you are taking, uh, you know, paying attention to the details on these issues. So Curtis, let's take a look at interplay between ADA and FMLA. Um, this sort of addresses that serious health condition and the difference in the definitions. Yeah, just like how FMLA came first and CFRA came later from California to expand the, the medical leave uh, rights that an employee can have. Um, ADA came first and then FIHA came later to do the exact same thing to expand the accommodation rights that employees have in California. So FIHA like, like Linda said, FIHA and ADA are very similar, almost the same. The, the, the difference is that uh, FIHA is going to be more expansive, is going to cover more employers, and is going to cover more disabilities and more perceived disabilities. So like, like Linda said, the, the California rule does not have the substantial qualifier that the ADA has. Any kind of limitation on a major life activity uh, will be considered a disability. And again, there's been a ton of litigation on what this definition means. Uh, so if you ever want to know if, if an employee's received or, or purported disability uh, qualifies under, under FIHA, then talk to your attorney, talk to me, talk to Linda, and we, 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 can, we can help you out on that. We can guide you on that. Exactly. Okay, so let's um, wrap up this with workers' comp uh, leave. So this applies to all employers, and please, 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 I hope everybody out there has workers' comp insurance. Every once in a while, I run across an employer that says, oh, we never got it. <laughs> I'm like, no. So you want to make sure that you have workers' comp insurance in place. Anytime an employee gets injured at work, this is going to come into play. If you know, they're going to have coverage in terms of medical care, perhaps time off, right? So let's say something serious happens, you know, you have a roofer, they fall off the roof, they, you know, break their back and they're going to be out for six months or whatever, workers' comp is going to come into play. But keep in mind that it's also going to run concurrently with FMLA, CFRA, you know, potentially, right? All of these different laws we've been talking about. So length of leave available is not specified on this one. They're entitled to have as much time off as they need while they're disabled. It's job protected subject to, you know, there's a business realities exception, but again, just be really careful because if you're running it concurrent with FMLA or CFRA, you have to play by the higher standard there. Obviously you're going to have some notice of this. And then can the employer require use? It's the same as FMLA and CFRA. No on vacation, yes on sick. And then the effect on benefits is the same. If you're running it under FMLA and CFRA concurrently, you're going to want to leave the benefits in place for, for at least up to 12 weeks um, protected under FMLA and CFRA. All right, so responding to workers' comp leave requests, you wanna make sure that you're giving them the DWC-1 form, which is that notice where they have to fill it out and say, I was injured and hear all the details and everything like that. Curtis, you wanna just talk briefly on Labor Code Section 132A? Yeah, 132A is a law in California that says you cannot uh, discriminate or retaliate against, retaliate against an employee who's made a workers' comp claim or retaliate against an employee who has informed you of a, of a work-related injury. Uh, we, we see these claims be made th sometimes, and sometimes we defend them, and sometimes they're not. But the idea is that when an employee makes a workers' comp claim, or if an employee informs you of a workers' comp injury, uh, you, they are protected, and you cannot retaliate against that person through any kind of adverse employment action, and you cannot discriminate against that person because they've made a claim or reported a workplace injury. And with the, the DWC form, you have one day to provide that, provide a copy of that form to the, to the employee. We saw FMLA was 
had had number of days was five days, and we saw um, other laws that were, were 10 days. But when it comes to workers' comp, you have one day to provide the employee with that form, and that form has to be partially filled out with your company's information and with the information of your uh, your workers' comp insurance carrier so that the employee can, can make a claim. Because workers' comp is covered by insurance, if it ever happens, I tell employers, try not to stress out about it. Just hand it over to your, your workers' right. comp insurance. Let your workers' comp insurance stress out about it. That's what they're there for. They're, you're, you're, they're buying your worry. You're paying them to worry about it for you. So always rely on your workers' comp insurance. So as you can see, like Linda said before, that when an employee goes on a workers' comp leave, it's potential that that workers' comp leave can run concurrent with other forms of uh, leaves of absence. And this is, we'll get to why this is important. Well, now, and then, and, and the next slide. But the idea is that, yeah, FMLA and CFRA and ADA and FIHA, these are all employee injuries that prevent the employee from working. These are all leaves of absence. And so all of these different laws can run concurrent. So you have to keep these in mind when you have an employee that goes out on a worker's comp leave. Absolutely. Now we did a whole webinar before on the interactive process. So I would encourage you to go out to one of our YouTube channels um, and look this up because we don't have time to go through this. If you ever have somebody that comes to you or you have knowledge that somebody may leave that may require a leave, then you have an obligation to enter into the interactive process with them to discover, you know, what could be a reasonable accommodation. So it might be time off. It might be something else, right? Like we had a situation a couple of years ago with an employee who was pregnant. She had to eat certain types of food. So she needed to move her uh, meal period and her breaks around so she could go back to her apartment and cook the food that she could eat while she was pregnant. So that was a reasonable accommodation and we were able to work that out. And that came because we went through this interactive process with her. All right, Curtis, we're going to run out of time here. So we're going to go really yeah. quickly through this, right? So I just hired an employee and on day one, she announced she's pregnant. Can you fire her? <laughs> right? No, <laughs> don't do it. Day one, she has rights. Yeah, she has rights on day one. Remember on PDL, there was no minimum service requirement. Um, my company isn't subject to FMLA because I'm a small employer with 15 people. One employee is a non-work-related medical condition that requires surgery, and her doctor says she'll need 10 weeks time off. Do I need to give her the leave of absence? Maybe. What? Depends on if it said maybe. Okay. Because you need to think about ADA, FIHA, and CFRA. You have to apply those laws. Just because FMLA doesn't apply, you're not out of the woods. You still need to consider ADA, FIHA, and CFRA. Exactly. So similarly, my employee with diabetes requested two months off, then extended for another month. Now he's asking for another two months off. Do I have to keep his job open if I have 50 or more employees? What if I have under 50 employees? Can I fire him? No. No to which the last question. <laughs> you cannot you cannot fire. You cannot yes. fire an employee for having a disability or medical condition. Exactly. Even even if somebody's not eligible for a leave of absence, you still cannot discriminate against the person because of their medical condition. That's a protected class. Absolutely. And as frustrating as that is to have it keep getting extended, 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 that is your reality. That's what happens all the time now. Uh, so my California company has 10 employees. One of my long-term employees used 12 weeks of CFRA in the first three months of the year. Now she wants to take another CFRA leave in October for her own medical condition. Do I have to let her do that? Or can I wait until it's been 12 months? Question. So before we talked about the the, the possibilities for setting your, your 12 month year, and if you have a rolling 12 month year, like we've suggested, then no, the employees exhausted the employees 12 weeks of leave for that 12 month period. And um, you can, you can deny the leave. But the second one is for her own medical condition. So again, you could deny it maybe under CFRA, but you may have to reasonably accommodate that request under, under FIHA. Right. Because this FIHA. is a 10 yeah. employees. Yeah. FIHA. So again, yeah, right. you have to take a look at all of these different details um, so my employee is covered by all of these different laws. He's been off work for five months and he keeps getting new notes from his doctor stating he cannot work. At what point can we fire him? 
this is probably the situation that has come up the most for us this year, where somebody continues to get extended, extended, extended. Yeah, and at this point, the person should just be on ADA or FIHA. And if that's the case, you can require the employee to pay for all of their health insurance premiums. So what I tell employers is if you're not, if it's not costing you anything to keep this employee on your records, then keep granting the leave. It's not hurting you. The only thing that's going to happen by firing this employee, the only, there's really no benefit to you. It's only going to be a negative, but you're only going to get sued. Right. Except you have um, to hold the position open, which is the challenging part. Yeah. Which so. I would, you know, what I typically tell employers is you can, you can, uh, spread the duties around. You can hire a temp. You can come up with other um, other solutions, but just know that as you're keeping that position open, if that person comes to work, you would have to reinstate that person. Absolutely. Um, I had okay. another thought, but I can't. I don't remember what it was. <laughs> You'll think of it in a second. Okay, right. so we're going to move on to other questions, and while you're typing those into the Q and A section, I'm going to let you know about a program we have coming up. Um, called Maximize Your Impact, Everything Disc Agile EQ uh, Workshop. So this is going to be, I have another slide with the details, but this is really important in today's environment, making sure that you have emotional intelligence, right? This is something that can really help you personally, but also help your workforce just have a healthier, more, um, trying to think of the right word, just a better environment for your employees to work in. So we're doing this live in person on May 10th. It is approved for five hours of HRCI credit. It does come with lunch and a personalized Agile EQ assessment that you'll take online it takes like 15 minutes. I put the link here for you to register. The cost is $249, but if you register by April 30th, just put in the code early and you'll get a 20% discount. So I hope that some of you will consider joining us. It's a great program. We've taught it on many occasions. Uh, we can send you all sorts of uh, recommendations from our clients on this one because they love it so much. So hopefully you can join us for that. And with that, Denise, I know we only have a couple minutes left, but I'm going to turn it back over to you to see if we have any questions. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. <clears throat> uh, question, when you were talking about FMLA, we had someone type in, what about uh, the questions on PTO? So what about if we have a combo PTO policy? Can we require the use of PTO for their own medical condition? You cannot, because you have to play by the higher standard, Curtis. That's my understanding, correct? Uh, yeah, that is correct. And that I, I believe there was a reference to that on one of the slides earlier. Yeah. Um, and it also, to, you know, we also have to look at which law this person is taking a leave of absence. Is it FMLA, C4A, PDL, FIHA, ADA? Uh, but like you said, if you have a combined policy, of paid time off that covers both vacation and sick, you have to comply with all paid sick leave laws and all vacation laws. So generally, because it's a combined policy and you're you're having to require or you're having to comply with additional laws, uh, you you cannot require it. Yeah, and at this point, we always recommend to our clients that you separate those two out for a lot of other reasons as well. Um, so whoever you are that you put that down, consider just separating those two benefits out. It'll help you in a lot of different areas, not just with response to the leave of absence. Hmm, There's a second question on the, the very same topic. So I'm glad we answered that. Yeah. Um, that's actually a good uh, suggestion because so many companies have gone to PTO. Um, if someone is not eligible for CFRA at the time of birth, can they utilize it once they are eligible, given if it's within one year of birth? I think you actually may have discussed that already. Can you ask her one more time, Denise? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, if someone is not eligible for CFRA when they give birth, can they utilize it once they become eligible if it's within the year of the birth? Yes. Now I understand the question. Yes, you can. So you always have to look at that and you want to make sure, again, that if they go out on a pregnancy disability leave law, then that time's not getting counted toward their hours worked towards CFRA eligibility. But at some point in time after they return, if it's in that year and they've worked their 1,250 hours or they've completed their one year of service, whatever, you know, 
both of those, uh, but whatever was preventing them from being eligible for, then yes, they are allowed then to take the CFRA for the baby bonding. Just has okay. to be done in that first year. Okay. Any of the other questions that came in were too specific. So um, if you have a specific question that you require additional uh, information on, uh, our team is ready to answer your questions because they will have to ask you other questions. So please reach out to Linda and Curtis or to your legal counsel to discuss it in detail. Yeah, and let me just tell everybody, part two of the leave of absence is gonna be on May 9th at 11 a.m. So the registration link is right there. You can always email one of us and we'll get it. I'll put it in the follow-up uh, email that you receive for attending today as well. So thank you very much for attending. Curtis, Denise, thank you guys as well. We'll post this recording out on the YouTube channels in the next couple of days. If you need HRCI credit, then look for the link um, in the handout or the link in the follow-up email. Uh, and take that survey, and then you'll be able to download your certificate. Thanks. Thanks, Have a Thanks good day. everybody. Thank you. Take care.